Search me, God. Look through me so you can see everything. You know my every thought. Where could I go from your spirit? Or where could I run from your presence? Search me, God. Know my heart. Break me and know my thoughts. Lead me in your way. How you guys doing? Awesome, hey, worship was incredible this morning. Um, you know, I woke up this morning with a sore throat, a cold, I couldn't breathe. Um, and so my voice sounds a little bit more manly than usual. I just want you to know that's kind of what's going on. But I'm excited about the word this morning. And so before we kind of do anything else, before we go any further in the service, I just wanted to take a moment and, and, and open us up in prayer because I just, I just hope that we're ready to receive what God has for us. I believe God's got a word for us, including myself this morning, and I want him to have his way in our hearts and in our lives. And so can we just uh, pray real quick together? Father, we love you. God, we thank you for your your presence that's in this place, Lord God. We thank you that your presence has the ability to change our countenance, to change our circumstance, to change our situation, Lord God. And so I just pray this morning that you give us eyes to see and ears to hear your voice, God. That we're here not just to punch a ticket, Lord God, or do a good deed for the week. Lord, we're here to meet with you. We're desperate for you. We need an encounter with your grace. We need an encounter with your spirit and with your love. And so this morning, Lord, we just open our hearts up to you and we just declare with one voice, have your way in us today, Lord God. Lord, I pray that you would increase and that we would decrease in this moment, Lord God, and that you would do something new in our lives, that you would burst something new in our hearts, in our lives, in our marriages, in our families, Lord God, in our ministries today, Lord God. And so we just ask, have your way. We love you. We honor you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. Well, I want to welcome you guys to week number three of our four-week series called Dangerous Prayers. And in this series, we've been talking about stepping our game up and taking our prayer lives to a whole nother level by stepping out of our comfort zones and not praying these easy, safe prayers, but by praying some dangerous prayers that believe God for more than just a quick fix or an easy way out. In fact, our kind of our working definition of what a dangerous prayer is for this entire series, if you're taking notes, is simply this, that, that a dangerous prayer not only asks God to change my situation, but also to change me. And we might find ourselves facing some, some difficult things in our life, or, or maybe we wish that our circumstances would be different, but the truth is we've come to this realization and this understanding that what we really need is for something to change in us. God, do a work in my heart and in my life. And so in week number one of this series, we talked about some different characteristics of dangerous prayers, that dangerous prayers are deeply personal. They're, they're birthed in brokenness. They reflect God's uh, agenda, and they stand on the truth and the power of God's word and his promises. And then last week in week number two, we were challenged to pray this same dangerous prayer that David prayed in Psalm 139, where we, where we ask God to search our hearts we ask God to reveal our fears and uncover our sins and lead us towards his plan and his purposes for our lives. And, and next week, we're going to conclude this series by praying the dangerous prayer, send me. Here I am, God. Anytime, anywhere, I'm available, God. Send me. Today, however, though, we are going to pray probably the, the most difficult, dangerous prayer of them all, and, and I would ask you this morning to consider praying the prayer, break me, break us, 
Oh God, and before we jump into the message, I do want to take a moment to look in the camera as I do each and every week to welcome the men and women joining us from the Correction Center of Northwest Ohio, all the students joining us from the Juvenile Detention Center, all those watching online, we love you, we're inspired by your stories, we believe in you, we consider you a part of our church family, so come on church, help me welcome our church family this morning. Yeah. Amen. So this morning, as we talk about praying this, this dangerous prayer, break us, God, and, and we study this, this topic of having a broken spirit before God, I, I was reminded uh, of a story about four years ago. We were in the first uh, year of the church plant, experienced church. We had no idea what we were doing. We still don't, but we really had no clue back then. And, and I'll never forget, it was a Friday morning, and we, we woke up, and uh, it was our day off. And so me and my wife, Justina, decided to take our two kids at the time to uh, Toledo to go visit the zoo and just have a fun day. And, Early on in the morning, we noticed that our oldest son, Jace, who had just turned a five, was walking around with a stiff neck. Like he wasn't turning his head when he was talking. He wasn't complaining, wasn't even, didn't even bring it up. But we noticed this is a little weird. And so we asked him about it. He said it hurts a little bit and woke up with it. So we thought to ourselves, well, maybe we should get this checked out before we head off to Toledo. And so we took him to the doctor, made an appointment, and took him over there. And next thing you know, we're on our way to Toledo, but not to go to the zoo, but to check Jace into the children's hospital up in uh, Toledo. And so it was much more, um, much more uh, of a difficult situation and much uh, more intense than we thought it was going to be, I thought we could just get some medicine and go to the zoo, but it was a little bit more complicated than that. So we check him in Friday night, and, and I'll never forget, they're trying to, they want to put an IV in his arm because they've diagnosed that he's got an infection in his, his tonsils, and it's causing him some pain and his stiff necks, and they wanted to put an IV in and give him an antibiotic, and so they had tried several different times to put the... The, the IV in his arm and, and those little veins to no avail. It's brutal watching your kid get stuck like five or six different times. And like you're looking at the, at the nurse, God bless, we love our nurses, but we're looking like, can we, just, can we just call it like the kid is dying over here and bleeding all over the place. And, and so they decided to, to put it uh, in his hand and so they call us back into the room and they asked me, uh, Dad, can you hold Jace down and make sure we put this, this IV and this needle on the top of his hand? And so I look over at Jace and I say, hey, Jace, uh, whatever you do, don't look. Like, look the other way. How I many know that was probably one of the stupidest things I could have said because Jace like looks away for a half a second and then he's right back and he looks at the absolute worst time because he sees this 12-inch needle getting ready to go. It wasn't that big, but I'm sure it was to him. Getting ready to go into his hand. He starts crying. He starts freaking out. He starts yelling. I'm, I'm able to hold him down. Uh, we got the needle in and the IV in, and, and they were, uh, got him back to his room and settled him down. And long story short, the antibiotic worked, and a couple of days later, he was able to come home and haven't had an issue since. But I couldn't help but think of that time Jace was freaking out, about to experience some pain in his life. And I thought to myself, man, that's, that's sometimes how I can respond to some of the painful moments in my life. I freak out. I don't want it. I scream. I cry. I yell. I want to do anything I can not to go through what I'm having to go through, not to feel what I'm having to feel. But how many of us know this morning, Jace needed the needle in his hand so he could get the IV, so he could get the antibiotic, antibiotic so that he could feel better, so that he could get better. How many of us know this morning, God doesn't always give us what we want, but he always gives us what we so desperately need. And could it be, as I was just thinking about this topic of brokenness and having a broken spirit before God, could it be that we get so used to dodging and deflecting and pushing down and pushing away these painful moments and these painful feelings that, that we miss what God intended these painful moments to produce in our lives. Because what I've come to discover, the more that I can embrace this brokenness, the more that I can embrace having a broken spirit before God, even though it's not the funnest, most enjoyable thing, what this brokenness produces in my life is this closeness with God and this freedom on the other side of those painful moments, on the other side of those painful feelings, and it's worth it every single time. And I want to challenge us to consider opening our hearts up this morning and allowing God to do a deep work in our lives by having the courage to pray 
Break us, God. Break me, Lord. And as we dig into uh, God's word and we study this topic of brokenness, brokenness, sometimes I I think uh, it's important for us to understand that there is one thing 100% of the time that that, that, that when God sees it, he's against it. He's against it when he sees it in a man, when he sees it in a woman, when he sees it in a child, in a company, in an organization, in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, when he sees it in our nation. And God's just not a a, a little upset. He's not mildly displeased. In other words, he's against it when he sees it. He brings consequences because of it. In other words, God hates it. And the reason why he hates it is because it's the opposite of brokenness. And it blocks us from having a broken spirit before him. If you're taking notes this morning, I want you to write this down. That God hates pride 100% of the time. God hates pride 100% of the time. And pride can simply be the mentality that, that we don't need God. God, I don't need you. And so I do my own thing and I rebel against him. Or it can be just this, simply this self-reliance to the, to the point where we just live our lives as though God doesn't even exist. Check out what James chapter 4, verse 6 says. It says, but he, he being God, gives us a greater grace. How many of us are grateful for God's greater grace in our lives this morning? Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud. He stiff arms him. He's against it. He hates it but yet he gives grace to the humble. And I don't know about you, but I need God's grace in my life. I wouldn't be where I'm at today if it wasn't for God's grace in my life. I can't do what God's called me to do if I don't have his grace. I can't be who God's called me to be if I don't have his grace. But if I'm really honest with you this morning, from time to time, every once in a while, not too often, kind of like an eclipse, every so often, I can struggle with having a proud heart. I feel like I'm not the only one in the room this morning. And I just, I can struggle with having a proud heart. I know that's kind of hard to believe. I know that doesn't make a lot of sense, Pastor, not you, but it's true this morning. But what I've learned, what I've discovered is this that the longer my heart remains proud, the more calloused my heart becomes. The longer I let pride remain in my heart, the more calloused my heart becomes towards God, towards my wife, towards my kids, to God's truth and God's principles in my life. And I, was, I, wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna share this, but I just feel like I'm gonna go for it this morning. I'm gonna get really honest and really transparent with you and and growing up as a kid uh, I played a lot of sports year round for so many years I wore a lot of cleats did a lot of cuts made a lot of jumps ran a lot and uh, over time I um, ended up developing two of the nastiest calluses on the inside of both of my big toes like they're pretty nasty I just want you to like I don't even whip them out and by wearing flip-flops too often because most people aren't able to handle what I got going on down there you know what I'm saying they are nasty but how many of us know this morning it's, it's one thing to have calluses on our feet but it's a whole nother thing to have some calluses on our hearts in fact to turn to the person sitting next to you, tell them don't let your heart get like pastor's feet tell them don't let your heart get like pastor's nasty Not good. You know, there's this time in, uh, hey, if you can't laugh at yourself, somebody else will. There's a time in the Bible when the disciples are asking Jesus this question, like, Jesus, why do you teach in parables? Why do you tell these stories with some hidden truths woven into them? And I think it's interesting how Jesus responds. Check out Matthew chapter 13, verse 15. Jesus said, for these people, these people's hearts have become calloused. You see, they hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. In other words, some, some people's hearts have become so callous, they don't want what God's trying to give them. They don't want to hear what God's trying to say to them. They don't want to do what God's trying to get them to do. And how many of us know this morning, that's the epitome, that's the definition of pride. He goes on to say, otherwise, they, would, they might see with their eyes. 
and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts. And if they could understand my truth, my plan, my victory, my freedom, what I want to give to them, that it's better, they would turn and I would heal their hearts. I'd heal and restore their lives. How many of us know, man, we don't want to get to the point where our hearts have become so callous that we no longer see God or hear His voice. In fact, the more calloused our hearts get, the more our lives become self-led instead of God-led. And if you're anything like me, man, my life didn't go so well when I was the one calling the shots. The more calloused our hearts become, the harder and harder our hearts get, how many know, it's, it becomes easier and easier to give in a t- temptation. The easier and easier is to become sinful and give in to our sinful desires. And all of a sudden, mediocrity just becomes the standard of our lives. That our standards kind of just shift downwards the more calloused our hearts become. And before you know it, we're just settling with, for less than God's best for our lives. The good news is there is one thing that if God sees it in in the heart of a man, a woman, a a child, when he sees it in a corporation, in that business, in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, if he sees it in our nation, whenever God sees this one thing in the hearts of his sons and his daughters, it doesn't matter how messy our past has been. It doesn't matter how many brutal mistakes that we have made or if we're carrying a ton of shame and regret. It doesn't matter if we've cursed God, been angry at God, turned our backs on God. It doesn't matter what we've, been, what we've done or where we've been that every time God sees this in the, the, the human heart, heaven rushes to connect with us. And if you're taking notes this morning, write this down. That's simply this that God responds to a broken spirit 100% of the time. What allows God to come into our lives and forgive us and, and cleanse us is when we come to this realization and this understanding that we are spiritually bankrupt. And we have a broken spirit before God and we just cry out to Him, man, I messed up, God. I don't have any excuses. I just need you. I'm desperate. For you. God, I need your forgiveness. God, have mercy on me. Check out Isaiah chapter 57, verse 15. The high and lofty one who lives in eternity. It might not be in your notes, but I'm going to give it to you this morning. The holy one says this. He goes, I live in the high and holy place. In other words, he says, I live in the high and holy place. In other words, the place that I dwell, and it goes on the scripture to tell us, I dwell with those whose spirits are contrite and humble. I restore the crushed spirit. I restore the broken heart, Isaiah tells us. I restore the the crushed spirit of the humble and revive the courage of those with repentant hearts. And God responds to a broken spirit 100% of the time. And as we talk about praying this dangerous prayer this morning of God, break us. Break me, oh God. I I think it's important for us to understand what we're talking about. And brokenness simply defined is is to, it means to, to shatter or to violently separate. How fun does that sound? God, break me, shatter me into a bunch of pieces. But, but brokenness is, is a circumstance or situation that we go through that alters who we are. It changes us, either in a good way or in a negative way. And brokenness can be brought about in our lives at no fault of our own. How many know life just happens? The Bible tells us the rain falls on the just and the rain falls on the unjust, that that painful moments and painful feelings, they're just a part of life. They're a part of a fallen, broken world. But brokenness can also come into our lives because of our sin and some poor choices that that we can make in our lives. Brokenness is a situation or circumstance that weakens us. In other words, in the difficult moments of our lives, when we're facing painful feelings and the painful moments of our lives, 
we have a choice to make. Either we, in our pride, we harden our hearts towards God, or in humility, we come before God with a broken spirit so that not only can he forgive us, but he can restore, heal, and redeem our hearts and our lives. That brokenness is less about our circumstances and more about our mindsets. Brokenness is less about what's happening to us and more about what's happening in us. That broken, brokenness is a mentality, it's a mindset. And I, and I love reading the Bible about the heroes of the faith, guys like Moses, who was a murderer, guys like David, who was an adulterer and a murderer, guys like Paul, who was a murderer. These are our heroes of the faith. These, these guys, how did these guys make the all-star team? Anybody ever wonder that? Sometimes I think we, we read these stories and they almost seem kind of fictional or, or we feel like these people in the Bible were, were just so far beyond us, like, like, like we could never become as good or as godly or as holy as they were. But the truth is, they were just as, if not more messed up than all of us. What a great statement this morning. The people in the Bible were more screwed up than you guys. No way. How did that? Nobody can be more screwed up. Yeah, in the Bible, they were more jacked up than you. But, but what separates them from so many of us is that they came to a point in their lives that they were willing to humble themselves and be broken before God and cry out to Him and repent so that God could restore them, heal them, and deliver them in their lives. Man, it's a good word. Pastor, I pray we would never forget how desperate we are for God. That as each day goes by, my awareness and my understanding of how much I need God would get greater and greater, not less and less. God, I'm desperate for you in my life. And so this morning, not only do I want to challenge us to, to pray this dangerous prayer, God, break us, but I also believe that there's some steps that we can take to develop a broken spirit before God. And there's a great example of this in the book of Nehemiah. And we studied this book not too long ago as a church. So I just want to briefly hit on it this morning. But Nehemiah gives us some, some keys to developing a broken spirit. So let's take a look. Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. It says, the words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev, November and December, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my bros, came from Judah with some uh, other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. You see, the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. In other words, Nehemiah, things are pretty bad. Some people that you love, some people that you care about, they're hurting right now. They're being broken right now. And in my opinion, some of the most difficult things we'll ever go through on the face of this earth is when the people that we love, people that we care about are suffering and we feel like there's nothing we can do about it. There's, we have no answers. We're powerless to help them in their suffering. I'll never forget a couple years ago, my good buddy Nate Lore, he's an overseer at the church. He's come here a couple of times and, and preached. And if you know Nate, he's kind of a man's man, big, strong, burly guy, hunter, just man of God, man's man. And remember, he called me up two years ago and uh, he wept like I've never heard him weep before. And he told me that his little girl um, was diagnosed with leukemia. And I've known Nate for 15, 20 years. I've never heard him cry the way he cried that day on the phone with me. And I was the first person he called after he talked to his family. And it was almost as if he was being strong for his family. And then he called me and he just let it all go. He didn't know what he was going to do. His little girl, his precious little girl, he felt powerless to be able to help her. And he didn't know what to do. I can't help but think that maybe some of us can relate to Nehemiah or, or Nate this morning that we're facing a situation, we're feeling a certain way, and I just don't, I don't know what to do. He goes on to say this, when I heard these things, Nehemiah said, when, when, I, when, I, when I heard how my people that I care about and I love were suffering, 
I didn't know what to do, so I sat down and wept. And for some days I mourned, and then I fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Nehemiah and his confusion, Nehemiah and his desperation, when he, he wasn't, wasn't sure what to do, he falls on his knees and he gets on his face and he prays and he fasted for three months, the Bible tells us. And he gives us this, this sample of what types of prayers touch the heart of God. Take a look at what he says. Then I said, then I prayed, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. And then here's his, Nehemiah's request. Let your ear, God, be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night. Your servants for the people of Israel. Notice the intensity of Nehemiah's prayer. Day and night. He's passionate, but he's also desperate for God to move. And so the first key that Nehemiah gives us in developing this broken spirit before God, if you're taking notes, is number one, a broken spirit begins with a restored view of God. Nehemiah prayed, God of heaven. In other words, the magnificent one, the all-powerful one, the, the creator. And then Nehemiah goes on to say, great and awesome God, faithful in your covenant of loyal love. You see, a, a broken spirit begins with a restored view of God. It doesn't come from beating ourselves up or lowering our view of ourselves. Notice Nehemiah in his prayer, he's not beating himself up. He's not saying, man, I should have been there. Why wasn't I there for them? I could help them. I could do something. He's not telling himself how, how awful that, that he is. And instead, Nehemiah has this high view of God because the truth is, we all have issues, don't we? We all have problems. We all have things that we need God to do in our lives. We need God to move in our finances. We need God to move in our marriages. We need God to move in our, in our families, in our careers. We're desperate for God. We all got problems. We all got issues. Maybe some of us this morning, we, we feel like God's calling us to draw closer to Him, but there's some stuff from our past that nobody knows about and we feel like we can't. We got some things that we've done and we just feel unqualified to be who God's called us to be and do what God's called us to do. We got some issues and some problems. And what I've noticed is that our natural tendency can be just to be so problem focused. Go from problem to problem. I'm going to focus on this problem. And after this problem's done, I'm going to go back. I'm going to focus on the next problem. And what ends up happening is we start to view God. We start to view our relationships. We start to view our circumstances. And we start to view our lives through the eyes of our problems. And before we know it, our problems seem really big. And our God seems really, really small. But I would suggest to us this morning that our God is really, really big and our problems are really, really small. Nehemiah sees this huge problem. It's a huge issue. It's beyond what he can do. It's beyond what one man in his mind thinks can even change. But he gives us this example of having God-centered prayers. Man, if I'm really honest with you guys this morning, I don't, I don't always have God-centered prayers. Sometimes I go before God and I tell him all my problems and all the things going wrong with my life. Sometimes I think we just worry out loud and we call it prayer. And we forget who we're even talking to. You see, I think we need to understand that a low view of God will cause us to be anxious will cause us to strive, we gotta fix it, we gotta figure it out, we gotta muster it up in our own strength, we gotta, we gotta handle this problem on our own, and it will lead us to a frustrating life. A low view of God leads us to a frustrating life, but a high view of God is not one that's problem-free. We still have problems and we still have struggles, but we view those problems and the struggles in light of His power, His strength, and, and, and his plan for our lives. And the, and the result is trust. The response is all of a sudden there's this trust that rises up in us. All of a sudden this peace rises up in our hearts. I know I'm struggling with this, but God, you're bigger than what I'm going through. I know this thing I'm facing, but God, I just know how big you are and how little this problem is. So I'm just going to trust you that you have a plan. You're going to work it out. And all of a sudden this peace just comes upon my heart. You're going to work it out because I have a high view of who you are. You know, yesterday we were at 
the uh, church office for corporate prayer, which by the way, I'm going to say if you've never been to corporate prayer, you are missing it because it's the best hour of your week. I'm just telling you that right now. And there's, there's like 40 of us gathered into the upper room at the office and we're playing some music and we're all praying about different things. We pray over your prayer cards. We're praying over the CCNO cards. We're praying for our community. We're praying for our, our government officials. We're just going after God, asking him to, to move in our hearts and in our lives, in our community, in our nation. And uh, I'll never forget yesterday, there was this song that came on called Miracles by Jesus Culture. It's a killer song, but it came on, it starts off, it's like, you're the God that opens blind eyes, you're the God that opens deaf ears, I believe in you, you're the God of miracles. And it kind of just mirrors that theme for like eight and a half minutes. Like he just keeps repeating that, I believe in you, you're the God of miracles. And I'm telling you, in the room yesterday, you could feel this shift take place. All of a sudden, people's faith and people's prayers went to a whole nother level. You know why? Because we were reminded of this high view of God. We were reminded how big our God is. Wait a minute, God. This is nothing for you. This is small compared to how big you are. It changes us. And so how do we, how do we get a restored view of God and develop this broken spirit? If you're taking notes, write this down. Simply become a worshiper. Become a worshiper. Become a worshiper. Become, how many know, becoming a worshiper, you're not just going to wake up one day with a tambourine in your hand. I don't even recommend you get a tambourine in your hand anyways, at any point in time in your entire life. But you don't just wake up and all of a sudden, I'm just a worshiper today. It just happened. No, how many know, it's something that we got to be intentional about doing. Because something happens inside of us when we just make the decision, I'm going to worship you. I'm going to honor you, God. I'm going to adore the name that's above every single name. But yeah, Pastor, the, but the music's loud. And, and I'm not a singer. You don't get it. Pastor, I'm not a singer. I don't got this voice. I feel weird. Do people hear me? I, I feel weird. I don't know what they're going to think if I raise my hand. I'm just not a singer. It's not my personality. It's not what I like to do. It's, just, it's, it's not what I'm about. And I get that. And I understand that, and I have compassion for that. But can I speak something to you this morning? Can I speak something to you this morning? Last time I checked, worship's not about us. Last time I checked, worship's not about you. So it don't matter if the, 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 the worship's loud. It don't matter if you are too worried about the, what the, I don't care what you think about me. I'm not singing because I got a great voice. I can barely even talk this morning. I'm singing because of you, God. I'm lifting my hands because of you, God. I came in this place to meet with you, God, to glorify your name, to lift your name, because I'm a worshiper, God. And we will never understand the power of worship until it no longer becomes about us. Some of you don't understand why we get so excited about what we're getting excited about because worship's still about you. You still worry about what the people think about you. You're still worried. It's all about you. And the moment it becomes no longer about you, you experience this power, this presence, and this freedom in your life. It will change your view of who God is. Psalms chapter 46 verse 10 says this, be still and know that I am God. We love this psalm, don't we? And we get quoted all the time. I mean, I put it on Pinterest and Instagram, do a little cool little picture of it, you know? But I think we stop there. Be still and know that I'm God. I think it's important the back half of verse 10. He goes on to say, because I will be exalted. Not maybe, not might be. God says, I will be exalted. I will be lifted up. I will be praised. I will be worshiped among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. This is God's command for us that we would become worshipers. I'm going to lift your name up. Because when we get this high view of God, then we get a recalibrated view of ourselves. How many know that to be true? When I can see God for who he really is, I start to see myself for who God created me to be. And that's why the next key uh, that Nehemiah gives us to help us develop this broken spirit before God's Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 6 through 7. Check it out. He says, I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. Isn't this interesting? Like, I don't think he did anything wrong. 
And all of a sudden, he still takes it upon himself because a, a different view of God gives us a recalibrated view of ourselves. He says, we've acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws that you gave your servant Moses. Nehemiah, he doesn't make any excuses. He doesn't blame someone else for the problems in his life. He, he's not pointing the finger at his situation to justify some of the choices that he's made. Instead, he just owns it. He just takes responsibility for it. And he just decides, you know what? I'm going to do something different. I'm going to do some things differently. In my, I'm going to make some changes. And he says, the changes I'm going to start to make starts with me. It starts with my heart. And the second key that Nehemiah gives us in developing a broken spirit is, number the, is this. Number two, a broken spirit leads us to an accurate. Everybody say accurate. An accurate assessment of ourselves. If you're anything like me, when I draw closer to God, uh, I always start to see things about myself that I don't like. Anybody found this to be? The closer I get to God, the more I start to see my shortcomings and struggles and sin and issues that I have. And in this, in this place that we can find ourselves in, we have one of two options. Either we can face those things and deal with them, or we can run. And we talk about praying this dangerous prayer, specifically this, this prayer of, of break me, oh God. I think, I think God would challenge us and, and show us. God. When we say, God, break me, break us, oh God, all of a sudden he wants to reveal some things in us that need to change, not to point out and have a low view of ourselves, but get us free so that we can see him and see ourselves differently. And probably one of the greatest scriptures on, well, let me just say this. So how do we get an accurate assessment of ourselves? And then I'll give you the scripture and develop a broken spirit. It's simply, man, we just get honest with God. Let me just get honest with him because he already knows. Let me get honest with him and get honest with myself. Because when I get honest with God, with where I'm really at, what's going on in my heart, my life, then I, can, I, mean, I'm, then I'm, I can't help but be challenged to make some changes. One of the greatest scriptures in the entire Bible about making some changes and getting honest with God is James 4, verse 7 through 10. It says, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. And as he comes near to you, as you draw near to him, he's going to point out some things in our lives that we need to address. He says, wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter into mourning and your joy to gloom. Man, that sounds exciting. Anybody else want to do that? It's not fun. It's not maybe easy. But that last sentence, don't leave out the last sentence. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. I'll just tell you right now, there's nothing greater than when God reaches down to his sons and his daughters and he pulls us up out of our junk, out of all of our struggles, out of our sin, and all of a sudden we experience this cleansing, this freedom, and this victory we never had when we were striving in our own strength. As God begins to do a work in our hearts and our lives, our prayers go from God bless me, God do this for me, God do that for me. Because when we get a, an accurate view of ourselves, we can come before God with boldness because we're no longer focused on us and consumed with what we want, but we're focused on Him and we're consumed with what He wants. And that's why the third and final key that Nehemiah gives to us to help us develop this broken spirit before God is this. Number three. A broken spirit results in a renewed commitment to fulfill God's agenda. It's about your agenda, God. Nehemiah is a new man. He's got a new view of God. He's got a new view of himself, and he sees his people that he loves and he cares about and how they're suffering and how, go, how they're going through struggles. And all of a sudden, he can't sit there any longer. Somebody's got to do something. It might as well be me. And he starts being about God's agenda, about God's business. Let me tell you something. You want to you wanna develop a broken spirit? Jump in with us for Saturday Serve Day. Get your hands dirty. Go into the community. Get, get messy. Get around some people with issues just like you who are struggling to make it, who are struggling with being addicted to drugs, who are, who are struggling. They don't know God. Go into the community and get your hands dirty. I'm telling you, it will break you. It will give you a different perspective of who God is and who we are and the call that's on our lives to be about His agenda. All of a sudden, some of the things that we care about day in and day out no longer are that important. 
because I was over there and I met a single mom and I saw how she's struggling and I saw the conditions that she's living, living in and my heart is broken for her. I don't care about what's on TV today. I got to go help her. I got to do something. I got to make a difference because my God cares about her. My God loves her. I got to get out of myself and be about his agenda. This side of the room is kicking the snot out of you guys. I just want you to know. I'm just telling you. I'm really killing it this morning. But isn't it, man, if we, we start serving and we get around other people that, that are just as messed up as we are and we get into their lives, it'll break us. It'll break us. And it will realign our perspectives and what really matters in life. It's really good. Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 8 through 11. Check out what Nehemiah prays as he's got this new vision of himself, a new view of God, and it's about God's business. He says, remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses. Nehemiah is reminding God of some promise that he, promises that he made to his people. He goes, saying, if, if you're unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. And Nehemiah's like, remember God? Remember when you said that? And, and remember that... We were unfaithful, and now we're, we're scattered all over the place, and we're going through hell, and, and, and life stinks. But remember also, God, the, the second half of your promise. He goes, but then you also said, God, if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there, and I will bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name, Jerusalem. And they are your servants, God. Remember, they're your sons, they're your daughters, they're your people, whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear hear me. Be attentive to the prayer of this, your servant, and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. His whole agenda is different. Man, God, let that be experienced church. And all the things that we care about, break our hearts more for the people around us. Break our hearts more for this community. Wouldn't that be a cool prayer for us to pray? God, let this community be different. The struggles and the pain and the poverty and the addictions and the hopelessness of the people that live in Defiance, Ohio, that I go to work with and I drive by their house, I drive through their community day in and day out. Let my heart break for them, God. Let me, God, do a work in this community. Why not Defiance, Ohio? Why not do a work here? Why not us? Why not this church? Why don't you pour out your presence and bring hope, restore lives? Why not? Man, when we, when we have this broken spirit before God, we start praying God-centered prayers. Gut-wrenching, honest prayers. And they're not hopeful prayers. They're promise-centered prayers. So how do we commit to fulfilling God's agenda and developing a broken spirit? Write this down, and we'll close. Stand on God's promises. So stand on your promises, not my feelings, your promises. Not my emotions, your promises. I'm standing on your word and your truth. You ground me. Your word grounds me. And I'll close with this awesome story that I heard of coming out of last week's um, Sunday and all the services. There's a gentleman that came to church here at Experience Church last week, and he's from another state, hadn't gone to church in years, experienced a lot of pain, a lot of suffering in his life, and he kind of hardened his heart before God. And then not too long ago, he lost his 18-year-old son in a motorcycle accident, and then lost his dad the very next week. And so he was in town from another state, for his dad's funeral and some people that attend Experience Church were there that know him. And they just invited him to come to church. And for the first time in years, he said yes and he came. And he sat in these seats and he had an encounter with God. Not a song, not a sermon, not a pastor. He had an encounter with God. And he humbled himself. And he cried out to God and he rededicated his life and he said, I'm going back home. I'm going to change jobs because I don't have the right job. My job's not a good environment. I'm changing jobs. I'm going to get plugged into a church. And I rededicated my life to God. How cool is that? Yeah. 
And probably the thing that I love most of all about that story is that it doesn't matter how long that we've lived with a hard heart or a calloused heart or how much we've ran from God, the moment, the moment we're willing to humble ourselves and have a broken spirit before him, heaven rushes to connect with us, to forgive, redeem, restore, and heal our hearts in our lives. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we just love you in this place. God, we thank you for your presence, how your presence changes everything. With every head bowed and every eye closed this morning, maybe you're here, and maybe you have been on that journey of hardening your heart towards God. Maybe you've been through some painful things in your life and it's caused a callousness in your heart and you've rejected God, you've stiff-armed God, you've ran from Him. And this morning you find yourself sitting in this place, not by accidents, accident, not by a coincidence, but because God has a plan for your life. God wants to meet you right where you're at. And you just feel, man, it's time. I've been running, I've been hard in my heart, I've been calloused. It's time for me to humble myself and say, God, I'm desperate for you. God, I need you. If you're ready to re rededicate your life to God, maybe you walked with him at one point in time, but you've wandered away, or maybe you've never surrendered your life. I'm not asking you to join a church. I'm not even talking about doing a bunch of good deeds and obeying a bunch of rules. It's simply entering into this relationship with God by saying, here I am, I surrender my life to you. And if that's you this morning with every head bowed and every eye closed, nobody looking around, I'm not going to call you the front or embarrass you in any way because it's not about me and you. It's not even about the people around you. It's about you and God. What's God speaking to you in this moment? And if that's you, would you just lift your hand up and say, that's me, Pastor. I'm ready to rededicate my life. My heart's been calloused. My heart's been hard towards truth, towards God's plan for my life, and I'm ready to humble myself, and I'm ready to let God into the depths of my soul and say, here I am, God. I surrender my life. Save me, forgive me, heal me, restore me. My life is yours. And right where you're at, would you just pray this prayer with me? Say, God, thank you for never giving up on me. Thank you for always believing in me. Thank you that you have a plan for me. And this morning, I surrender my life to you. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to pay the price for my sin on the cross. God, forgive me my sin. Fill me with your spirit. Show me how to live. My life is yours. In Jesus' name. God, as we continue praying this morning, I pray for each and every one of us that you help us to have a broken spirit before you, that we would have the courage to say, break us, God. That you would give us a restored view of who you really are, a high view of you, God. That we'd be able to have an accurate assessment of ourselves and we would be about your agenda, Lord God. God, we want to have a broken spirit before you. We love you, God. We honor you. We praise things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen.